Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Ho. H to the OV. I used to move snowflakes by the OZ. I guess even back then you can call me CEO. Hello, fans of all ages. This is indeed the Beast of the East. Ryan Morick here with you on WRPR 90.3 FM, Rampo College Radio. No Scott Thompson with me today, but thank you for tuning in on this Monday, November 2nd, 2015. Beast of the East, WRPR 90.3 FM, Rampo College Radio. Coming to you live from Studio A here in Rampo College of New Jersey in Mawa, New Jersey. Again, no Scotty T, but... We will have Shane Sullivan, who is the founder of BaseballFam.com. He also has a Twitter account. It's at SHT. I figured you guys can spell that out. At SHT Ball Players Do. 24 years old. This guy's an entrepreneur. He gets paid to talk about baseball, so we're really excited to have him on. He'll come on at around 620. I apologize for the uh, the background noise. Your That thing hasn't... Stopped going off for the last, I don't know how long, but somehow we're going to have to deal with it. Uh, But the baseball season's over, and the Kansas City Royals are world champions. And to be completely honest, the Royals were, without a doubt, the worst matchup for the New York Mets. I looked at this series when it first started, and I said to myself, you know what? If the New York Mets can take down the Chicago Cubs, then there is no possible way that the Mets are going to lose to Kansas City. I thought that once the Mets got past the power hitters that are the New York Mets, excuse me, that are the Chicago Cubs, I thought that the World Series was theirs, plain and simple. And it turns out, that that was actually the better matchup for the New York Mets. We found out that in order to beat the Mets, you need a lot of guys who know how to get on base, a lot of guys who know how to fight, and that is the Kansas City Royals. That's how they are, and they know how to beat you. They don't beat you because they hit well. They beat you because they know how to play the game of baseball. We'll get into it in a little, in a couple minutes. But you see Eric Hosmer running on on every chance he can possibly get. As soon as Eric Hosmer saw a chance, he took it. We'll get into the play uh, with David Wright and then do it uh, airmail in the throw. And then even the delayed steal later on. People said that he read a, a ball in the dirt. He did not read a ball in the dirt. The guy was stealing no matter what. And... An unbelievable play by Eric Hosmer. And this team just knows how to get it done. You don't look at their lineup and you say, I'm scared of this guy. I'm scared of that guy. They don't have threats like Anthony Rizzo. And they don't have the guys who you really go up, who you really go up against and you say, okay, this is going to be a very tough matchup. But the thing is, I think that is their strength. The Kansas City Royals, they, they have the right guys. They don't have the good guys. They have the right guys. You heard that phrase in Miracle where, um, where Herb Brooks says, I'm not looking for the good players. I'm looking for the right ones. And that's the Kansas City Royals. The Royals are, without a doubt, the most complete team in the major leagues. They have base stealers. They have a solid offensive core. They have good starters. And they have a great bullpen. And they can play defense. And the thing that killed the Mets was their defense. Yoan Cespedes killed them. Daniel Murphy killed them. We'll get into that in a moment. But the Royals were flat out the better team. The best team in the league won the World Series. That's how it is. That's how it was this year. The best team was the Kansas City Royals. They are world champs. Now, the main story of last night is obviously the Matt Harvey situation where... Terry Collins said that he was coming out after eight, and then Dan Worthen went up to him and said, you're done, and then Matt Harvey kept saying, no way, no way, I'm not getting taken out of this game. You heard it over and over again. No way! 
way. No, that's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. You, There's no way that they were taking out Matt Harvey. No, there's no way that they should have taken out Matt Harvey. They should have started him in the ninth. And the thing that gets me was that they did not go batter by batter. Terry Collins said after the game that if he just did one batter, then Terry Collins didn't do his job as a manager. The, the point of extending someone's outing is to go batter by batter. You don't know. Terry Collins said that the idea wasn't to go batter by batter. If he went one batter, then what's the point of putting him out anyway? The point of going batter by batter is to see if he has it or not. And you know what? Matt Harvey didn't have it after going into the ninth inning. I'm not going to criticize Terry Collins for throwing him out in the ninth inning because Matt Harvey was the best option. Familia has not been very good as of late. He was dominant in the NLDS and the NLCS, but since the World Series, he had two blown saves. One of them wasn't his fault. And then last night was definitely not his fault, obviously. But he has not been on his game. Matt Harvey was the best option in the top of the ninth. You send him out there. And if you're worried about his pitch count, Matt Harvey has four months to rest up now. And you know what? Stick with Matt Harvey. This was the guy where a month ago we were questioning if he wanted to throw. All those questions went out the window last night. This guy wanted the ball more than anyone on that New York Mets team. He wanted to finish this game, and that's why you heard him go, no way, no way. We saw the conversation he had. And you know what? He couldn't get the job done, and Terry Collins waited one batter too long. He walked Lorenzo Cain, who was a threat on the base pads, and then he left Harvey in, and then the next batter got a double. Cain stole the base, double, two to one game. And then a ground ball to first base, then moves over the runner. And then we all know the play where right through to Duda, and then Duda airmailed it. So again, not criticizing Terry Collins at all for sending Matt Harvey out. I'm going to criticize Terry Collins for two things. And neither of them are throwing, giving Matt Harvey the chance to start the ninth inning. The first thing I'm going to criticize him for is, I mean, I've been saying it since the show started practically, he left him in one batter too early. One batter too much, excuse me. As soon as he walks the guy, Terry Collins has to go out there and say, you're done. Because Terry Collins went against his gut once already. You couldn't go against your gut twice, and that's what he did. He went against his gut and said, all right, Matt, finish it up. You want this, go get it, which is okay. Matt Harvey wanted that ball, and he convinced Terry Collins that he wanted to get, he wanted to get the final three outs and send the series back to Kansas City. And you know what? Props for Terry Collins for believing in his players. I give him a lot of credit for that. But once you see that Harvey walks the first guy, then you have to take him out. You have to take him out. Because right then and there, that's when you realize that Matt Harvey is no longer the best option in the top of the ninth inning. That's when you have to bring in Jerry's Familia. And then the second thing I'm going to crit criticize Terry Collins for is the fact that Terry Collins didn't have the nerve to go up to Matt Harvey himself and say, Matt, great game, you're done. That's Terry Collins' job, to go up to Harvey, give him a hug, give him a kiss on the cheek, and say, you threw one heck of a ball game, and he couldn't do that. Instead, he had the pitching coach go up to Matt Harvey and say, Terry says you're done. And then you saw Matt Harvey eyeball Terry Collins like a hawk and ran after him. So let me get this straight. Terry Collins can go up to Matt Harvey in September against the Yankees and say, you're done after five innings when, you're th when he's throwing a gem. But in October, November baseball, in game five of the World Series, a must-win, mathematically a must-win game, you, couldn't have the, you didn't have the nerve to go up to Matt Harvey and say, you're done, 
great game, you have to tell the pitching coach, I've been a big fan of Terry Collins all year. But you know what? The World Series, he did not manage very well. He did not manage the bullpen very well. He did not manage Matt Harvey very well last night. He didn't. It's that simple. As a manager, you have to know that you are taking control of the players. And you know what? Uh, Again, I give Matt Harvey credit for wanting the ball. I give Terry Collins a lot of credit for trusting Matt Harvey and wanting the ball and giving him the shot to start the ninth inning because the fans were chanting, we want Harvey. Everyone wanted Matt Harvey to go out there for the top of the ninth. And then it didn't happen. Why, I don't know. He just didn't have it. His stats after his 100 pitches are not very good. Maybe that's why Terry Collins wanted him out. But Harvey was throwing a gem, and I think Collins made the right decision by starting Matt Harvey. But he did not make the right decision by telling Harvey that he was done, A, and then, B, taking him out after the walk to Lorenzo Cain. One batter too much. I mean, Collins, it's not that he didn't even have, he had no excuse for it. He didn't take the blame on himself. He literally said that, He didn't want him to go batter by batter. I've never seen a manager go against the batter by batter scheme. That's what you're supposed to do. If you see that someone doesn't have it in the first batter, then you got to take him out. But he didn't do that. And you know what? If you're going to blame Terry Collins, you have to blame that. You have to put the blame on that because that is bad managing. That's bad managing. Managing, especially for someone who used to be a bullpen coach. Bullpen coaches know a lot about guys' arms, and he didn't manage the bullpen well. He didn't manage Matt Harvey well. There's there's no excuse for that. There is no excuse for that, and he didn't have one. And but he didn't have one because he said he basically did not believe in in having a a batter by batter form. How could you not go batter by batter? If he goes one batter, then that's not his job. You know what? That is his job. And it's your job to make sure that he gets those batters out. Would Familia have gotten out the side? I have no idea. He only did, he did face only three batters last night. You never know. It is a whole different situation. But you can't leave Matt Harvey in the game when he walks the leadoff batter. You can't. You can't. Because that puts a lot of pressure on him. And you saw Terry Collins after Lorenzo Cain walked. He was not happy. He was mad at himself for being pushed over. And then once he's so mad at himself, why didn't, why didn't he go with his gut then? You see that Matt Harvey walked some guy. You're mad inside that you let your player walk over you. And you don't do anything about it. That's bad, bad managing by Terry Collins. And again, he, had a very, he managed very well this year. He managed very well in the first two series. World Series, he did not manage very well. Now, the other play that had a huge effect on the game, obviously, the Lucas Duda play. Real quick, if you're blaming David Wright, Stop. David Wright did everything perfectly. He did everything perfectly. Was it Wilmer Flores' ball? Sure. But you know what? David Wright did the right thing by seeing that it was a slow roller, cutting Flores off, and then what was the first thing David Wright did when he fielded that ground ball? Something that every infielder is taught to do when there is a guy on base. Always check the runner before making the commitment to throw to first base. And that's exactly what David Wright did. People are saying that if you let Flores that if you let Flores feel the ball, David Wright would have been playing more toward third base and he would have held on Eric Hosmer. Eric Cosmer was no more than nine feet away from the base. And you know what? Wilmer Flores would have done the same thing. 
Wilmer Flores, if he fields that ball, he would have checked and went and won. The same thing that David Wright did. So you're telling me that if David Wright was shading more toward third base, Eric Hosmer would have been staying on the bag? No shot. Eric Hosmer was running no matter what. Ryan Morick, Beast to the East, WRPR 90.3 FM. Please call in with your thoughts, 201-825-1234. That is the phone number, 201-825-1234. We'll have Shane Sullivan on in about four or five minutes. He'll be on at 620, so stay tuned for that. But call in, 201-825-1234. But again, Eric Cosmer is a very aggressive base runner. Eric Hosmer was going anyway. You saw just before that the ball was released, he was going. As soon as the ball made contact, he took a couple of steps off of third base. The only way he was not going is if the ball was hit right to Murphy or Duda. He saw that a long throw had to be made from the left side of the field, so he went. So you cannot blame David Wright at all because he did the right thing. And you know what? David Wright is a much better fielder than Wilmer Flores. It's that simple. You cannot blame David Wright. And I know Keith Hernandez, 11-time Gold Glove winner, he even criticized David Wright. I'm sorry. Skill does not mean you're, you're smart. I, I'm not taking anything away from Keith Hernandez. The guy is very smart. But you know what? I think David Wright did the right thing. I think that... He was supposed to field that ball, and he did so, and he did it the right way. David Wright did nothing wrong. He did everything fundamentally correct. As soon as he fielded the ball, he checked to see where Hosmer was, and then Hosmer went. Hosmer was going no matter what. And we saw with the delayed steal later on in that game, Eric Hosmer did not see a ball in the dirt. Eric Hosmer saw that Darno has zero arm, and every time Darno catches a ball, he has to frame it to, make, to show the umpire that it's a strike. So you know what? Eric Hosmer, great job. Eric Cosmer did not read a ball in the dirt. Eric Cosmer was, did a delayed steal all on his own, and that's, that's amazing baseball IQ by Eric Cosmer. Aggressive base runner, and both times he ran, it worked out. And you know what? People aren't criticizing David Wright or Wilmer Flores if Lucas Duda makes a good throw. Everything was perfect for Lucas Duda. He's a right-handed thrower, so he didn't have to pivot. There was a strike right to him, and then he just lost it. And you know what Kansas City scouting report said? It said we're going to run on two people, Lucas Duda and Travis Darno. That's simple. And you know what? That's what Eric Hosmer did. He ran on both Darno and Duda in the span of two or three innings. All Duda had to do was have a decent throw. A halfway decent throw would have had Hosmer, and we'd be going to game six in Kansas City. That simple. That simple. But Lucas Duda just threw it to no man's land. All the throw had to be was on the glove side of Travis Darno and not five feet over his head. It had to be from the chest down. Darno, catch, tag, game over, game six in Kansas City. So you know what? Blame right, blame whatever you want. But you know what? If Lucas Duda makes the throw, then we're going to game six in Kansas City. Because David Wright threw a strike. No matter who was throwing that ball, Flores or Wright, Eric Cosmer was still going. No matter who threw the ball, Flores or Wright, Lucas Stewart made a terrible throw. He had so much field to work with. All he had to do was throw the ball on his right side, Darno's left side, the glove side. And he threw it to the backstop, and, and it was a terrible throw. You look at the people are comparing it to 50 cents first pitch. That's what it looked like. That's how bad of a throw that was. 
And people are going to blame David Wright because he didn't hold on Eric Hosmer. Again, Eric Hosmer was running either way because the Kansas City scouting report said we're running on two people, Lucas Duda, who has no arm, clearly, and Travis Darno, because he has no arm. The last time the Mets threw someone out from the plate, caught someone stealing, September 30th. September 30th was the last time a Mets catcher threw someone out. So they went the whole postseason without throwing out a base runner. Think about that. We got Shane Sullivan on the phone. Shane, what's going on, buddy? Not much, man. How you doing, Ryan? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks a lot for calling in. So... Real quickly, before we get into all the baseball talk, tell us about uh, the website, the podcast, the Twitter account. The, real quick, actually, quick question. Was this the plan when you were in my situation, college student, trying to look for a job, you played college ball? Was this your plan? Dude, there was no plan at all. The plan was, <laughs> honestly, it all started with the Twitter account, and the plan was, I'm sitting in night class right now. These things are like three hours long, and they stink, and they're incredibly boring, and i got to find something to do. So I would always like scroll Twitter, and I found some accounts that were kind of doing what I was doing, and to be quite honest, I thought they were pretty bad. And I was like, this looks like it could be kind of fun. I know I can do it a heck of a lot better. <laughs> I started it, started tweeting in class, and now here we are four years later. Sweet. Well, congratulations on everything. That's awesome. That's an awesome story. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you brag about it a lot. Um, tell us real quick about the new website, baseballfam.com, formed what just about a month and a half or so ago, and now that comes with a new podcast. Tell us all about that. Yeah, man, it's really exciting. Baseballfam.com uh, launched about two months ago, kind of in affiliation with the Twitter account, and the podcast is uh, came out October 19th. So. It's only been doing a couple of weeks, and I, uh, like I said, it's really just an affiliation with the Twitter account, kind of a, a place where I can give my thoughts that are more than 140 characters or a 10-second Snapchat or whatever. And it's, um, you know, I think we're pretty unique. We've got a, a pretty sweet team of writers that are all baseball players themselves, and it's kind of just a look at the baseball media from the perspective of the actual players. So, you know, like bringing uh, a lot of, we got a lot of really big name, cool guys. MLB players on uh, for the podcast this off season. We got a sweet schedule, and uh, I think people are just enjoying the fact that it's a place to read and write and and hear some baseball perspective from the guys who are actually doing it. I mean, nothing against uh, ESPN or MLB Network and all those guys, but you know they were communications majors in college and ended up writing about baseball. You know, I think it's uh, kind of refreshing for people to have a place to go and listen to a podcast and read a website where the content is coming from us, the baseball players. That's awesome, man. And did you predict any of this? I mean, you, the Twitter account has over 110,000 followers. You're already on, you're already one of the number one podcasts on iTunes. Did you expect any of this to happen? I expected none of it to happen. I mean, this is all, I'm, I'm as shocked as anybody, but you know, it's just, it's just been so much fun. I guess I'm the luckiest guy ever because everything that, you know, we've been doing seems to be hitting pretty well. But, I mean, baseballfam.com wasn't the first website we launched. I mean, we screwed up like two or three of them before and really just took everything I learned and put it into the new site and the new podcast. And, yeah, I mean, the podcast is, is a ton of fun. I mean, you've got your own radio show, too, so I'm sure you know all about it. But, yeah, it's a lot. Um, you know, being in control of the own show and, and deciding who we bring on and, um, it's been a lot of fun, but I was so shocked with the, the response. I mean, the, the following that we have and the readers, we got like 100,000 readers a month online. Like you said, the podcast went up to number one. I mean, seeing, seeing the podcast ahead of like Colin Cowherd and Fox Sports and ESPN was absolutely insane. But I think it just uh, goes to show how awesome the audience we've built is and how much they're really looking forward to what we're putting out. Yeah, that's sick. Congratulations again, man. Before we get into all the World Series talk, speaking of the World Series, you're a huge Indians fan. They were predicted by Sports Illustrated to win the World Series. You know this more than I do. What the heck happened? Oh, my goodness. Dude. <laughs> if I had the answer to that question, I'd probably be working for the Indians right now. I don't, I don't think very many people know why that happened. I mean, I don't, I don't remember ever being as excited going into a baseball season as I was this one. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of weeks before the season came out, ESPN or 
to release those, or some of the Sports Illustrated to release those regional covers with, you know, Kluber and Brantley on it, saying the Indians were going all the way. And actually, when, um, after the Royals, I think their divisional series game, Lorenzo Cain came on and they were asking him on MLB Network what, you know, what he had predicted the AL Central to look like before the season. And he came right out and said they thought their Indians were going to run away with it, with that pitching staff. Man, I don't know what happened because if you look at that pitching staff, I mean, if you look down at the numbers, that's a tie, top five staff in the league. So we got Brantley, Kiffness, Lindor. Every, everything looks good, man. But the only thing I can think about is the lack of power, home run. And that's what you look at the Astros and the Cubs and the Blue Jays. You look at all the teams that made it all the way this year, and they were just hitting the ball in the park. And I think that's one thing the Indians lacked. And that might be, if I had to pick something, that might be what I put my finger on. Maybe next year. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> uh, so obviously the big story, especially since we're in the tri-state area, was the, is the Matt Harvey, Terry Collins situation. What do you think Collins should have done with Matt Harvey last night? 110% uh, go to familiar right there. Even I, at the start of the inning? Even at the start of the inning, I, I, can, I was sitting on the couch. I was watching the game with my brother, and I looked to the side. I was like, there's no way – you put Harvey back out there. I, I get it. I get Terry Collins. I get the fans. You know, I get Harvey coming up to him and just saying, no, 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 I'm going yeah. back out. But this is the world. Like, if this was a movie script, yeah, throw Harvey back out there. But this is the World Series. Right. I understand Familia hasn't, you know, had his best stuff. But he's your closer. That, that's his role. That's his job. I can't think of a more clear-cut position to go to your closer. So, you know, it, it's definitely pulling him after he walks the leadoff guy. I don't. That's what I really. Yeah, have that say, didn't make any sense. No, but to me, man, if I'm manning the reins, which I'm definitely not, and I'm not qualified to do, but I'm going to familiar right there. Yeah, I said the two things that I was. Crit- I, I was a fan of putting him out there, um, but the two things that I criticized him for were not taking him out after the leadoff walk, and then the thing that I thought was big was the fact that. He couldn't tell Harvey himself that he was done. He had to tell the pitching coach to tell Matt Harvey. Yeah, that was an interesting move. I, I you know, hadn't really thought about that too much, but um, I don't really know what to think about that, man. It, it's, it's tough to speculate what their relationship is. If you, you know, remember back to Terry Collins press conferences when all the news came out about Harvey's inning limit and stuff like that, I'm sure Collins wasn't a happy guy because yeah. he He's the one stuck in the middle. He's stuck in the middle of Harvey, his agent, and the organization. So it's tough to really speculate on what their relationship is like. And maybe you, you know, saw some of it with that. Right. Off season started. What are your early predictions for the Mets Royals? Even throw in your uh, predictions for your Indians as well. Well, the Indians are going to win the World Series <laughs> next year because uh, I mean the future is bright. I mean all their big teams. Agreed. They got them all back next year. So we've got arguably the best coach in baseball, Terry Francona. I got mm-hmm. full 100% faith in that guy. So um, hopefully uh, ESPN and Sports Illustrated won't throw us that preseason jinx mm-hmm. again. That would be great. But uh, the Mets future is bright too, man. I mean, they, they kind of got to do it now. If you look at that pitching staff, it's, it's going to be the best in baseball. If you're looking at what it's like next year, if you've got a healthy Harvey, DeGrom, Syndergaard, you got what, Zach Wheeler coming back, right? Yep. Yeah. Matt, I mean, that, that's nice. And you're getting them all for about half a million dollars a year right now. Yeah. You know, so you're obviously not going to be able to keep all those pieces for very long. And, and the moment that they show signs of not seeing success for a couple of years, I mean, it's going to be a fire sale of those guys. You know that while they're, uh, you know, while they're worth it at the top. So they better, uh, if they want to keep those guys, they better stay relevant. But I think they will. That pitching staff's just way too good. Before I let you go, Shane, what's in store for your future with the website, the podcast? Uh, basically, what, what's the future as your entrepreneurship, I guess I guess I can say? Honestly, man, when it comes to all this stuff, I don't really, con- really concentrate on the entrepreneurship part of it because this is very unique and out of the box. I'm just, from day one, the way this whole thing has started is just me being a passionate baseball fan and you know, putting my word out there. So I think it'd be crazy if I tried to think of it too much of as a business and instead of just worrying about putting the best baseball content out there. So we're going to keep doing that podcast on every social network everywhere. And uh, hopefully people are going to continue to watch and listen. Shane Sullivan, thanks a lot. Who you got on the podcast uh, for Wednesday? 
We've got Astros stud young pitcher Lance McCullers. I'm very excited about very nice. Everyone go check out the podcast, the Baseball Fam co- Podcast. Check out BaseballFam.com. Follow him on Twitter at Shane Sully. Also at SHT. Can't say it on the radio. At SHT Ball Players Do. Go check him out. Very knowledgeable guy. Shane, thanks a lot for stopping by. Hopefully we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. You too, man. Shane Sullivan. Go check him out. Very bright guy. Uh, like I said, big Indians fan. Knows what he's talking about. Um, ho- hope for the best of what he does. He, the guy's a young guy. He played baseball for a long time. Played four years in college. Go check out his website. Go check out his podcast. You heard that he's going to have an Astro arm on the podcast. So it'll be a lot of fun. Scotty T's not here to do updates. So I'm going to try to do them myself it's gonna be the first time in uh a little while but here we go anyway with your round of updates the women's volleyball and jack tournament will start tomorrow the round for roadrunners are the four seed they will take on the five seed rowan profs tomorrow night at the bradley center scott and i will be on the call at that game you can hear that game right here on wrpr the winner will travel to top seed at stockton on thursday night the Mets cross country team finished in second place at the NJAC Championships. Jerry, Jeremy Hernandez won the AK. Matt Tui finished in second. Paul Julis in fourth. The women's team finished in third place. Paris Hughes was Ryan Post's top finisher at third place overall. Emily Brock earned seventh place, while Emily Kroonquist placed in tenth. The men's swim team defeated SUNY New Paltz on Friday. The 400-yard medley relay team placed first overall. Aspen J. Tucker and Peter Kellner finished 1-2 and two in the 200-yard freestyle, while Jose Alvarez captured a first-place finish in the 100-yard backstroke. R.J. Carrillo placed first in the 100-yard freestyle, while Rampo captured the top three spots in the 200-yard butterfly. Tucker also captured a first-place finish in the 100-yard freestyle, while Alvarez placed first overall in the 200-yard backstroke. Carrillo added another first place finish to his day with the 200 yard breast. Jesse Smith and Gene Pozniakov went 1 2 in the 100 yard fly. Smith also won the 200 yard instant medley. The women's swim team lost to SUNY New Paltz on Friday. Maggie Herbert won the 50 yard freestyle and the 100 yard freestyle. Brenda Arthur captured a first place finish in the 100 yard butterfly. Both teams return to action on Saturday when they travel to TCNJ, who is nationally ranked at 1 o'clock p.m. Moving on to the pros, the story of the day. The Royals are World Series champs after the Mets squandered a 2 0 lead last night. Terry Collins left Matt Harvey in the top of the ninth, but he couldn't close the door. Eric Cosper scored the game tying run on an errant throw by Lucas Duda, top of the 12th. Christian Colon got the game winning RBI single. The Royals scored four more runs after that. They win the game 7 2 and the series 4 1. Salvador Perez was named the series MVP. Moving on to football, the New York Giants scored 49 points and lost the second team in NFL history to do that. The Saints kicked the game-winning field goal as time expired. Despite Eli Manning throwing 350 yards and six touchdowns, three of them to Odell Beckham Jr., but Drew Brees topped out with seven touchdowns and 511 yards of his own. The Giants move to 4-4. Four four. They will face the Buccaneers next Sunday in Tampa Bay. The New York Jets also lost. They lost to the Oakland Raiders 34 to 20. Fitzpatrick left the game with an injury, torn ligaments in his non-throwing thumb. They brought in Geno Smith. He didn't do terrible, 27 for 42, 265 yards, two touchdowns and a pick. But Derek Carr, on the other hand, 23 for 36, 333 yards and four touchdowns. The Jets moved to four and three. They will take on the Jags next week. The Knicks are two and one. They beat the Wizards 117 to 110 on Saturday. Melo dropping 37 that night. The Spurs. Visit the Garden tonight at 7.30. The Nets are 0-3. They lost to the Grizzlies on Saturday, 101-91. The Nets shot 3 for 11 from three-point range. They'll look to win their first game of the season tonight at 7.30 as the Bucks come into the Barclays Center. In hockey news, the Rangers are off tonight. They will take on the Washington Capitals tomorrow night at the Garden. And the Devils beat the Islanders in a shootout on Saturday. They'll face each other tomorrow night at the Barclays Center. You're listening to Beast of the East on WRPR 90.3 FM, Rampo College Radio. We'll be back after this. You're listening to WRPR Mawa. Now that's a face for radio. It's perfect. 
It's unbelievable. It's a miracle. It's a TV dinner. It's WRPR, Mama Ramapo Radio. It could change the world. Hey, parents of children with asthma, here's another hit from the Breathe Easies. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke around the kids in the house. Don't smoke in the car. Don't smoke in the house. Don't break my heart. Preventing asthma attacks can be as simple as making your home and car smoke-free zones. For more Breathe Easy tips to help stop asthma attacks, go to noattacks.org. Brought to you by the EPA and the IQ. Hey, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers for Rad. I'm here to remind you that drunk drivers are still a major killer of young adults in this country. So always choose a designated driver. And remember, music lives, you should too. Getting born in the state of Mississippi. Papa was a copper and the mama was a hippie. A public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Rad, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. No Scotty T. No Scotty T, but we have to do Beast of the Week anyway. Scott said he was going to call in, but um, he's not calling in. Maybe he'll call in later with his thoughts. My Beast of the Week. He had Drew Brees throw seven touchdowns, 511 yards. But you know what? It was against the Giants defense. Still very impressive. But I'm going to give it to Eric Hosmer. We saw what the guy did last night. A very smart baseball player. The guys know what he's doing. Getting the game time run in the, in the top of the ninth. Going with that delayed steal. This guy just knows how to play. And he had a rough game in game one. He had that error. But you know what? He redeemed himself with that game winning sack fly. And this guy can just flat out play the game of baseball. So there it is, Eric Cosmer, my beast of the week. Congratulations to Eric Cosmer and the Kansas City Royals on winning the 2015 World Series title. Ryan Morick, Beast of the East, WRPR 90.3 FM, Ramapo College Radio. Calling with your thoughts, 201-825-1234. That's 201-825-1234. We're going to stick with the Mets talk before we get into the Giants and Jets talk really quickly. But before we do that, we're going to open back up the phone lines, and we're going to see who this is. Who's this? Where are you calling from? That's uh, Matt from Oberg. What's up, buddy? Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, man, what's going on? I uh, just wanted to talk about maybe... Uh... Obviously, the World Series, and then, you know, if I'm the Mets GM, what do I do next year? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, just to start off, the Mets, the Mets belong. They're not far off. You know, sometimes you get those teams that they kind of make it, but it's like, if they're going to make it back next year, yeah, you know, you really have to tweak some things. Right. But I don't think the Mets are that. I mean, the Mets completely overpowered the Cubs, and this has to be the most competitive five-game World Series of all. Oh, oh yeah. Fine. Without this is up there with two thousand, I think. That they're really similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean the Mets are in in the ninth inning three times, eighth and ninth inning three times, and you know, just can't close the door. And I get it, that's what the Royals do, but but still. Um Arthur, what what was your uh what was your take on last night, Terry Collins, Matt R V going into the ninth? Um, he should have started the ninth inning, but once he walked Lorenzo Cain, you have to take him out. That's my thought. Okay. And I was I not agree. a fan of the pitching coach going up to Harvey and saying that he was done. I think that yeah. should have been called you know a job from the I think people don't, people don't realize how mental this game is, and I think had Matt Harvey walked in the dugout and Terry Collins said, you ready to go, kid? I think this would have been, I think he would have went out there and he would have seen a different Matt Harvey, just because you know, having to fight your way back onto the field just adds a lot of pressure, walks the first guy, it's just, you know, yeah, that's a good um, point. I mean, if yeah. Collins treats it differently, if Collins gives Harvey any sort of confidence, then yeah. who knows? That's a good point. But um, So I guess just moving on to next season with the Mets, a lot of the key guys you're probably not going to have back, Murphy, Cespedes. Um, I think Cespedes walks. I think Murphy walks. 
but I'm not too comfortable with Delson Herrera coming in and playing second base next year. I know they kind of believe in him, but I really look to get rid of Duda. Um, I, I don't really like Lucas Duda. He's got to be the streakiest player in the league. And it kind of reminds me of Mike Davis where it's like, well, he's going he's gonna to hit you the 30 home runs, so you keep him around, but right. he is hot. We don't really need him to, and you know, when, when he's off, he's really off. So I would try to sign Daniel Murphy, and this isn't just me overreacting as a Met fan because he had a great postseason. He's a great hitter. Yeah. And you could probably put him and Conforto back to back, and they're both really good hitters. They use the entire field. They don't strike out. Yep. Um, and I tried to use Daniel Murphy as my first baseman, and David Wright, who knows how many, David Wright could miss 100 games next year. We don't know. Yeah. He could play third base for David Wright when he needs to. I like keeping Daniel Murphy because he doesn't strike out, and he has power when he wants to have power. So my infield kind of looks something like David Wright at third base, I, and I try to make a move for a shortstop instead of going for, you know, a second baseman. And I, uh, I try to stick someone there, and I... You know, that, that's kind of like, maybe you put David Wright at second base. I don't know. Uh, I think they might try to make a move for Reyes. I don't know how I feel about that. But. I know, yeah, you're, you don't seem like too big of a yeah. Jose Reyes fan. But, I'll, I mean, I don't know. We'll see. I think that they should sign Daniel Murphy, not because of what he did in the World Series. I just think that Daniel Murphy is this team's best hitter. It's going to be yeah. him and Conforto. They're the two best contact hitters. They're the two best hitters for average. It's that simple. I think that you'll get away with Murphy's defense, and the only reason why you didn't get away with Murphy's defense is because you were playing the Kansas City Royals. That's yeah. That's just the thing that happens. And who knows? Murphy can improve his defense. It's he's gonna have a lot of work. I and think my, that they should point, be putting, signed Murphy. Putting him at first base. Sorry, putting him at first base. You kind of I don't want to say you eliminate it, but right. the whole defense thing is a little underrated when you put him at first base. Yeah. So. I mean, he, but I, he would, the thing is, Duda has the arm problem. Murphy has the glove problem. Yeah. So you put Murphy at first base. He probably makes that throw yesterday. Uh, but, wow. yeah, I think they got to re-sign yeah. Murphy. I think that – I don't think they should heavily pursue Cespedes, as, as insane that, as that might sound, because I, I, he's, not a, he's not a 300 hitter. No. Cespedes is usually a 250, 260 guy who's going to hit 20 to 25 home runs. Did he have a great year? Absolutely. But that's not the Yoan Cespedes that we usually see. I'm in favor of letting him go. I think you have to. And especially because I mean, I'm obviously extremely – you don't have to have great, great hitting when your pitch rotation is going to be Harvey DeGrom, Syndergaard, Matt Wheeler, whatever, but – you know, I mean, you're gonna to have to you have to pay some of those guys sometime. And Yohannes Cespedes seems like a guy that you waste money on and you lose some of your pitching. I, I like Yohannes Cespedes. Go. I agree. I agree. And then you have to worry about. I mean, I know you got to focus on next year, especially, but you really have to focus on four or five years from now. Who would yeah. you rather give that money to, Harvey Degrom, Syndergaard, or Yohannes Cespedes? Yeah, exactly. The easy yeah. answer is the three pitchers, without a doubt. How are you, how are you today? Are you? Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it hit me more in the morning, and then I, uh, you know, you go and you watch all those like fan made 2015 playoff pump up videos yeah. and this and that. It's just just remembering all those moments. You know, Dick, can I ask you what's your favorite moment of the Mets season? Mine's obviously the the Wilmer Flores walk off after crying on the field, this and that. But just full, it was just full of magic. What, what was your favorite Mets moment of 2015? Because I know you followed the team. Just about as close as you did the Yankees. That, that's not true. That's not true. It is true. It is. You, I, I know you didn't watch the Mets when you were watching the Yankees, but you would flip channels and you would get back to me on what you thought about every Mets game. Right. Whenever the Yankees were not playing, I was watching the Mets. If the Yankees Absolutely, were in a commercial, yeah. I'd turn on the Mets game. But, I mean, the Wilmer Flores thing is, is really, like, the cliche answer. Yeah. I think that you know, that's probably it because – once yeah. that happened, then you really said to yourself, this team is not out of it. This mm-hmm. team wants to win. And as soon as Wilmer Flores hit that walk-off, that's when you said to yourself, this is magic and something very, very special could happen. That and David Wright hitting the home run when he came back. That was awesome. Those, was are, awesome. those are probably my top two of the, of the regular season because those, 
Because those hits, they really made you say to yourself, there is a chance and next year might be this year. Unfortunately, yeah. next year was, was not this year. But, but those are the moments where you say to yourself, there is a chance. And those are the moments where you say to yourself, something special is going to happen. Uh, I, I think the Mets are the team to beat in the National League next season. Just the rotation is just unbelievable. They're, they're the team to beat. I think I agree. I think that I, I, we don't know what the Nationals are. Last year, they won 97 games. This year, we expected them. They were, were predicted to be yeah. the only 100-game winner. And look what happened. They didn't even yep. make the postseason. So yeah, you never know way, what, just, what you're going to get with the Nationals, think, but we'll see. I don't think they get to throw in the Mets with that rotation. I really don't. But, um, you know, I'll be excited for next year. I think the Mets find their way back. It's going to be a long off season. Um, I'm sorry about your Giants yesterday. I'm sorry for myself about the Jets yesterday. Yeah. It was a rough football Sunday, and I guess that's really all I have now. Yeah, that was – that was. I was going to try to talk about that if I ever got a chance to because obviously it's a heavy Mets day. But, yeah, that Giants game was really terrible. Was, like, I, I, I don't know how you throw for there that many yards and then they touch on to lose the game. It's, it's, because, it's, because the Giants are not a smart football team. They're not a good football team. They're a 12-4 and four offense with a 4-12 and 12 defense. And yeah. – then they're not smart. They are not smart, and they just find ways to lose, and that that's going to be their bugaboo this year. That's simple. Yeah. All right, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, no problem. All right, um, hang in there. The Jets are going to make the playoffs. Don't worry. Uh, I, I hope. I don't know. I mean, after yesterday, it, it, yesterday really killed them, but I think they, they they are still in good shape. Yeah, but that loss just felt like last year's loss to the Chargers, and and Geno Smith is on the field. It was just such a terrible feel. I just no, I, I yeah, I know. Yeah, it it was rough. It was yesterday. It was a tough day. Yeah, I, I like the Jaguars as a nice bounce back game this week, though. Oh yeah, oh yeah. If, I mean, if you don't win next week, then uh, yeah, then I'll no matter who's playing quarterback. Field. If I, if I'm playing quarterback, you should win next week, Ed. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, Matt. All take right, buddy, care. We'll talk to you later. Um, yeah, Mets. I think they should sign Murphy. I don't think they should heavily pursue Cespedes because that's not the type of player he is. Um, but we'll see. They have a lot of decisions to make. Opening up the phone lines again. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Ryan. It's Scott. Hey, what's up? What are you talking about? Um, the Mets, as usual. Oh, man. Sorry. Oh, man. All right. Well, I got 10 minutes. Let's talk. You do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what time's your uh, What time's your game on your softball game? Seven Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Is Ange there? What? Is Ange there? Yeah. Yeah. Tell her I said what's up. And Ryan says what's up. She said what's up. All right. Ange D'Amico, the greatest softball player to step foot in Albridge High, High School. school um, yeah. We talked about Harvey. We talked about David. I mean, I, I want to get your thoughts on Harvey and the, the Harvey Terry Collins thing. What do you think they should have done? I honestly think that he should have he should have went out. The guy was pitching lights out, brilliant display of baseball, Ryan. And you can't. I mean, obviously you can't argue that. It's just when he came out, when he went into the ninth inning, the guy tried to overthrow yeah. the whole time. He was too pumped up instead of settling down and getting the job done. Yeah, the guy was sprinted to the mound. <laughs> sprinted to the mound was throwing gas in warm ups. Uh, Jimbo was telling me yesterday. Like, he heard the glove pop from the third deck. Like, he, he, he was overthrown to Lorenzo Cain. You could see that. Yeah. That's where that walk came from. And Eric Cosmer was just basketball looking. And you know what? It, Terry, Terry Collins did say, you know, I let my heart decide over my gut. And, you know, what? there's nothing they can do about it now. But I don't know. I just, I just feel like Matt Harvey should have went out because with 40,000-plus 40 40, people calling his name, I mean, how, how can you not? You know, after the display he put on all day, what do you think? I think he should. I agree, but he should have been taken out after the walk. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree after that. But Terry Collins said that he said after the game, he's like, I'm not going to put the guy on for one batter if I was going to put him out there. I thought he was completely wrong in that. The minute you saw him walk him, you knew that there was going to be a little bit. I knew he was going to steal, too. Did you see the camera angle that they showed? Yeah. Perfect camera angle. The guy was leaning on his right leg. Harvey's not quick to the plate, and Lorenzo Cain's as fast as they come. So, mm-hmm. you know what? 
can't say anything about it now. Obviously, there's going to be he said, she said, and what ifs. But you know, we can only speculate at this point. Yeah. But right. I, I just want to say congrats to the Royals, real quick. Yeah. They an amazing job, an absolutely amazing job. They outscored the Mets fifteen to one after the seventh inning. That's just insane. You know, the absolutely Mets had insane. the lead in forty three out of the fifty two innings. No, and that's just how resilient this team is, and you just got to commend them for it. You knew, you knew coming into this that this was going to be the Mets' hardest, hardest uh, job. And yep. you know what's funny? Like we remember, I picked the Mets in four or five, and when you look huh. at that stat, when they led for every inning but ten, you look yeah. at that stat and you say, "There's no way that the Mets lose this series, let alone losing five games." No, not at all. Not at all. And if they could only finish it but last night and go to Kansas City, you got the Grom and Syndergaard on the mound, who knows what would have happened. Yep. Who knows? But they just couldn't close. You know, Duda panicking on that throw, all he had to do was put a nice shot on it. And there's just so many what-ifs that happened just in that inning alone that, you know, everything was working in the Royal favor. It just, it just seemed that way. Ryan Morick, and now we got Scott Thompson on Beast of the East, WRPR 90.3 FM, Ramapo College Radio. We got about 10 minutes left. Not sure if we'll get into the Giants and Jets talk. There really needs, doesn't, nothing needs to be said about that. Um, if there's time, we'll talk about it. But right now, the thing that I want to talk about is how Met fans treated Daniel Murphy and Joanna Cespedes in this World Series. Them absolutely, two guys brought you to the World Series. You are begging the Aldersons and the Wolpons to re-sign these two guys. But the last thing of 2015 they're going to remember is them being booed off of the field by your own fans. Pe- players remember that, Scott. And if you boo, I mean, I've never, I, I have n- never, to my knowledge... Boo to someone that is on my favorite team. I've never done it. Absolutely At least I don't not. think I have. Could I have? Probably. I've been rooting for sports for 20 years. Have I shown negativity? Have I wanted someone off of the field? Of course I have. But I have never booed anyone on my own team. That is because we are sports fans, Ryan. Remember what happened with A-Rod. A-Rod was getting booed up at that by Yankee fans. Yep. I, I, it was, it's despicable when you think about A-Rod, who was a big part in the in their recent World Series win, and you're just going to boo him the next couple of years. That, that's, that's what it reminded me of at first. But like you said, Daniel Murphy and you want to are the reason why you even made it to the playoffs in the first place. Yep. And you're going to boo them? And you want to re-sign them? Honestly, if I'm your line assessment as especially, he, the guy's asking for about 200 mil. That's what he's going to be yep. projected to ask for. The Mets, I don't know if they're going to put that up. But after what happens, I don't think that your line assessment of all people, he's going to go to a place where he's loved and he's wanted. Mm-hmm. How can you switch your entire mindset on one person in, in the span of, what, seven games? or yep. However many games happen. You know, Danny Murphy, same thing. He basically won you the NLCS. Yeah. I mean, I get it. You you have to state the facts, and you have to accept the fact that Yohan Assessment and Daniel Murphy did not play well in the World Series. No, Yohan no, Assessment didn't. didn't play well throughout the entire postseason, and Murphy batted, what, 150, 170 in the World Series? I get it. You're not happy with them. but And it's okay if you say something like, how can they screw up this badly, blah, blah, blah. But to be at the game and boo them, and they sing, they practically single-handedly brought you to the first World Series since 2000. The Mets had a chance to win their first World Series since 1986. 29 years, and it will be 30 concerning they lost. And you're going to boo the two main guys who brought you to the World Series. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? It's just it, it's just mesmerizing, Ryan, honestly, because look at all the charisma that was behind this team before this World Series, and one thing happens wrong. Game one just, just switched off Mets fans. It's just the, the way they went about everything, the way they conceived all that happened, 
it wasn't on just one person. You can't blame Daniel Murphy and Yohannes Cespedes for losing the World Series. Lucas Duda throws that ball away. Game one, Jerz Familia throws a ball right down the pipe, tries a quick pitch instead of throwing a sinker. You know, there was so much that went wrong. The Mets lost the World Series. Yeah. You know, it's not one person. So the fact that they got booed is just, you know, it's just, it's just awful. It's just awful. I feel bad for them. I, I commend all that they did this year. We did it. We were talking about it the entire year. These guys were great. There's no doubting that. And just the fact that, that even happened, awful. Peter Rosenberg awful. said something that made a lot of sense on the Michael K. Show. He said that people were booing, were booing Daniel Murphy because he couldn't feel the ground ball. Why are you deciding to boo Daniel Murphy now when he hasn't been able to feel the ground ball for years? And yeah, you know what it absolutely. is? Those He's are the guys, those are the time. fans who didn't watch a play up until October. Yeah. It's yeah, that simple. Literally half half of the fans. Yeah. They weren't even watching the Mets because yeah. they had no shot. But then, you know, as the team and, you know, tables turned. But like I, I, I said on the, on the show before, Ryan, I wanted to switch it up a little bit. The Mets, I said this before, the Mets – will only lose the series if they beat themselves and what happened. Yep, exactly. They beat themselves. A-Rod said it also. They just beat themselves. They couldn't capitalize when they had the lead. Yes, this team is good. Yes, they're scrappy. Yes, they put the ball in play. But they beat themselves because they, the Mets were the better team, in my opinion. And in my opinion, they really were. With that pitching staff and the way everyone was hitting, they were the better team. And we saw we had, they had the lead innings one through six. You know, this isn't Little League. You've got to finish a major yep. league game. You've still got three innings left, and that's it's crunch time. So they just couldn't capitalize. And the Royals, adding to that, now it's 6-0 and for teams that have made it back the next year. You know, no one's lost. So. And another thing that the players are going to remember, I mean, I get it. You don't want to see another team celebrate a World Series victory on your own home field, especially when you lose 7-2 to and just get completely embarrassed from the ninth inning on. <laughs> But if, if your team was not expected to make it to the World Series, and they do, and they bring you so much happiness for essentially the last two months, three months, August, September, October, they not bring you so much months, happiness, Ryan. and you what? leave the game early and don't even give them any credit. No. Uh, kudos to the, to the fans that stayed that they went out and, and uh, clapped to and, and, sh- and shook their hands. Yep. Those, those are the true Mets fans because they understand that it's not just three, four months worth of of baseball. You got three, four years out of these new, out of these pitchers. You have a young team. The, honestly, they're going to get another playoff shot. World Series, who knows? But playoff shots, absolutely. Definitely. Same for the Cubs too. These young teams are just going to throw themselves all up in the rankings because they're they're in the primes. They're the young guns, and they want it. So that's the, it's what's going to happen. So the Mets fans that are booing and are leaving after the ninth inning because they know their team's going to lose, even though it's a tie game, shame on you. I mean, uh, shame on you. I mean, once Duda threw that ball away, I kind of had a feeling that it was oh, over. Yeah. I had a feeling. Oh, yeah. And you know what? I'm going to go back to when we went to the wild card game. Down 3 nothing in the bottom of the ninth. I knew it was over. But... I had no idea the Yankees were going to play the wild right. card game. I didn't think they would be 500. Yeah. And they made it to the postseason. And I sat there and I, I, I clapped for the Yankees because yeah. I didn't expect it. And that's my way of thanking them for a great season. Absolutely. We did the same thing. We were sitting there, we stayed. You know.